In this video, we're going to break down some of the most important mechanics for you to learn in Dragonflight PvP, and make them simple, easy to understand, and guaranteed to help you climb in Season 2. It doesn't matter if you play melee, ranged, or healer, we'll cover mechanics for everyone, including an interesting technique used by Peekaboo. Even if one mechanic doesn't apply to you, most of them will, so be sure to watch until the end. Some of what we will cover today comes directly from our new Master in Minutes courses, which can only be found at skillcap.com. These guides condense years of arena knowledge into bite-sized pieces, which makes it easy to maximize your improvement. We're also rolling out new micro-commentaries for every class, which teach you how to implement rank 1 level mechanics into your own gameplay. The best part? Everything at Skillcapped is risk-free to try, because we offer a rating gain guarantee while actively using our website. Click the link below to get started and get the rating you've always wanted. Anyway, back to the video. First up, we have a few different ways to use Shadow Meld. These days, Night Elf is one of the most popular races in PvP, and for some good reasons. At the most basic level, Shadow Meld can be used to drop enemy targets. In many ways, this makes it function sort of like Feign Death or like a weaker version of Vanish. When used at low HP, Meld can give a split second of pseudo damage reduction since it means players won't be able to actually see you. Because it drops target, it can even allow you to get off cheeky casts. Shadow Meld will drop players as a focus target, which makes it possible to squeeze in casts that would otherwise be interrupted by players spamming focus interrupts. For healers, a similar concept applies, just in reverse. Shadow Meld can be used to avoid important spells mid-cast. By pressing Meld in the middle of Polymorph, it means the cast will be unable to land, assuming the melded player stays in stealth. Shadow Meld also drops combat, which is why many healing specs prefer Night Elf as their primary race, since it allows easy drinks mid-arena. You obviously can't drink in solo shuffle, but in 2v2 and 3v3, this is a fundamental mechanic. This is also why rogues and feral druids prefer to be Night Elf, since the combat drop allows them to re-stealth and prowl on demand. Shadow Meld is also known for its more advanced ability to immune projectiles. Any spell that has a travel time can be immune by pressing Shadow Meld within a small window of the cast landing. Here, for instance, the Warlock will start casting Chaos Bolt, and while the spell is mid-air and about to hit us, we will meld. And in doing so, the spell gets completely immune on impact. It is even possible to immune spells that don't have travel times, like Psychic Screen. This requires Shadow Meld to be used in a very tight window, at almost the exact same global as the AoE. Honestly, Shadow Meld is arguably the most complicated racial in all of WoW PvP, and there are several uses we could cover. Let us know if you have any class-specific uses of Shadow Meld in the comments below. Next up, we have a very interesting mechanic with a name we're not proud of. Players like Snuts and Chanimal sometimes talk about it on their streams, so you might have heard about it before. It's called Weaning. Yeah, no wonder the name hasn't caught on. Weaning is basically just kiting, but taken to the very extreme. The goal is to do whatever you can to take as little damage as possible. For melee, it means doing a hit and run, stunning a target and then running away before the stun ends. This is useful for rogues or windwalkers who can't really go toe to toe with something like an arms warrior or ret paladin. By weaning, you give yourself time for your stuns to come off cooldown while minimizing the damage you take. To wean, you have to think like a boxer, doing whatever you can to avoid getting hit. As a ranged DPS, weaning is an essential mechanic. The goal is quite simple, zone out your opponents with whatever tools you have. Players like Chanimal are exceptionally good at this, and you can do it on almost every class. Even after he teleports, notice how Chanimal continues to move away from the enemy team, making sure to be at maximum range, which encourages the Red Paladins to swap off. Once this happens, he's able to freely cast. Healers can even wean as well. Just ask Joe Fernandez, who's been getting weaned on for over a decade. Why is this mechanic so powerful? It's because it minimizes the damage you take while also giving you more opportunities to keep up pressure. For classes who get trained a lot in solo shuffle like mages, rogues, hunters, or even death knights, weaning is an essential mechanic. Even though it might have one of the worst names in PvP history, being a good weaner is an essential skill to master. And for any squishy classes, it is one of the best options you have to surviving in solo shuffle. With mainly having unlimited mobility, you need to do whatever you can to never get hit. And speaking of essential skills, you should definitely incorporate NPC stomping into your Season 2 gameplay. There are tons of non-player targets that you should be hitting more often in Arena. Shaman totems are the most obvious example. Healing Stream, Stone Skin, Sky Fury, and Healing Tide are all high priority targets that are worth killing as quickly as possible. As a melee, you should be on totem stomping duty at all times, even sniping grounding totems for your teammates. Even though this may seem minor, killing these totems takes away a bunch of mitigation and healing from the enemy team, which is like doing an extra 500k damage that doesn't show up on the scoreboard. 
The only totem you really shouldn't attack is Earthen Wall. It has way too much HP to be killed quickly, so don't even bother. With that said, Shaman totems aren't the only thing worth stomping. There's also demo warlock NPCs like Fell Obelisk, which is basically a totem for the warlock and their pets, allowing them to snowball pressure if not killed. With 10.1, Call Observer got massively buffed for all Warlock specs, and if you aren't quick to kill it, your team will get blasted by laser beam damage. This means you need to be on the lookout for any flying octopus in Arena if there is a caster on your team. Staying on this topic, we might be seeing more Shadow Priests this season after their redesign in 10.1. If that's the case, then definitely be on the lookout for Psy Fiend. It will channel a Psy Flay cast that reduces healing taken by 50%, making it one of the strongest healing reduction effects in the game. Luckily, Siphine doesn't have that much HP, so a single attack or two is usually enough to take it down. Better priests will shield their Siphine immediately, but your goal is still stomping it down right away. And with Arms Warriors likely being popular in the Season 2 meta, don't neglect War Banner. If you play any class that relies on CC setups, be ready to snipe War Banner on sight. Better Warriors will usually wait for micro CCs to land first, like Intimidation or Dragon's Breath, and then try and War Banner the Trap or Polymorph, which means you have a very small window to land the headshot. Moving on, while it is technically an NPC as well, we thought we'd have an entire section devoted to Spirit Link mechanics. If you're on the same team as a Resto Shaman and they drop a link to help themselves or your partner, not only should you stand in it straight away, but you can also help out even more by using any self-heal immediately in the Spirit Link. This includes health stones or any other instant HP boost. Since everyone's health is being redistributed, you can instantly heal your teammates to get more value out of the Spirit Link. Doing this with Healthstone is quite strong because Warlocks have a passive called Sweet Souls, which allows them to gain HP when anyone else in their team eats their cookie, effectively double dipping the health restoration effect. On the flip side, if you're playing against a Resto Shaman, Spirit Link is a high priority totem to kill. In fact, it might be the highest priority in specific situations. If you manage to kill the Spirit Link before every player gets inside, you dramatically reduce the value of this major cooldown. If killing the Link isn't an option for whatever reason, an alternative counterplay is to knock players away from its radius with any knockback mechanic. In fact, knockbacks have their own set of unique uses beyond being a simple kiting tool. There are multiple AoE defensives that can be soft countered by any multi-target knock effect. This includes Power Word Barrier from Disc Priests, Anti-Magic Zone for DKs, Darkness for Demon Hunters, or even Earthen Wall Totem for Resto Shamans. Since the only way to benefit from these effects is by standing in a radius, a simple knockback is an efficient counter. Of all the knock mechanics in game, Ring of Peace is probably the strongest to counter these AoE effects since it will constantly bounce players out of the helpful radius. This makes it the perfect anti-cooldown and ideally should be saved for this exact interaction. There are additional uses for any knockback too, and they do more than just displace enemy players on Z-axis maps. We're not saying this tech is outdated, but in the year 2023, knocks can do much more. Mages can even use Nox to help set up their CC. Notice here how the enemy druid is in tree form with Dragon's Breath still on CD. To play around this, Zaryu uses Blast Wave to knock the druid into the Ring of Frost, landing CC that would otherwise be impossible. Remember earlier in this video when we showed you how Shadow Meld can be used to immune spells? One important part of this interaction is how every spell has a travel time, which is its own Pandora's box of weird mechanics. For one, the damage value of spells gets calculated when the ability first leaves the caster's hand. This means spells sometimes seem to bypass damage reduction because the damage was calculated before the spell even lands, which even allows damage to go through Aspect of the Turtle, for instance. Devastation Evoker Mastery gets snapshotted in a similar way, which enables them to deal huge front-loaded damage by abusing travel time. But what does this all mean for you? For one, it means that you need to use the defensive before big spell damage actually lands, because once the spell is midair, your defensives don't matter. Next up, we have a counter to everyone's favorite healer, Fistweaver Monk. Look, we know they just got nerfed, but in case they ever become meta again, there are a few counters you need to know about. The fact that they need to damage with melee attacks in order to heal should give you some clues on how to counter their toolkit. For one, anything that prevents melee damage entirely will also deny their heals. This includes cooldowns like Evasion, Blur, Blessing of Protection, and Die by the Sword. If these effects are active, the monk will not be able to heal off the target. Unfortunately, disarming a monk doesn't do anything since none of their melee attacks actually require a weapon. A fairly common strategy in a Fist Weavers is to trade these cooldowns aggressively in order to prevent any healing. If you have a target low or if the monk is coming out of CC, denying their melee attacks will dramatically hinder their healing output and can be the deciding factor in scoring a kill. 
On top of this, because their healing scales off damage, it can be directly reduced with any damage mitigation effect, like pain suppression as one example. When PS is up on a target, the monk's healing output gets nerfed. This doesn't mean you should be spamming cooldowns just to kill a Fist Weaver. Instead, look to get double the value by trying to mitigate offensive cooldowns while also nerfing their heals. Even if you don't have immunities or major damage reduction, you can still try and zone the enemy monk, either with roots, slows, or knockbacks, treating them more like an actual melee DPS rather than a healer. Also, be sure to kite out of the blue AoE effect of Feyleen's Stomp, since this will allow them to deal even more damage, which means more healing. If you see this thing on the ground, get out as soon as possible. Even though disarms might be worthless against monks, they're actually quite strong into another meta spec, arms warriors. That's because disarm effects completely prevent warriors from using die by the sword since it requires a weapon. So just like you might trade an immunity to prevent fist weaver healing, you should also consider disarming warriors while they are low on HP or coming out of a stun to deny them from using their biggest offensive. Disarms can also deny some healing from death knights by preventing the use of death strike. The same concept applies here. If you're close to a kill, then a quick disarm on a DK might be enough to close out the game. DKs are also vulnerable to any silence effect for similar reasons. If you silence a DK, that means they can't use anti-magic shell since it's technically a shadow spell. Many major defensives can be prevented by silence mechanics, including pain suppression, life cocoon, and even iron bark. Even though silence effects aren't too common these days, they're still a unique preemptive counter to major cooldowns. We have one additional bonus mechanic which Peekaboo has been using for years with many players not even knowing it exists. But just as a warning, this is very niche. We don't recommend this for everyone, but might be worth trying. Let's look at Peekaboo's Kickbind. It lights up, but the spell isn't going off. But why is this happening? It's because he's using a custom setting to only use spells on key press up. Normally, your spells will get used the moment your finger presses the bind down on your keybind. Instead, you can use advanced interface options or a console script to change this so spells are cast on your finger is released from the keybind. That's exactly what Peekaboo is doing here. He holds down his kickbind to cue the interrupt for when he releases his finger. The only catch is that now he is locked into using kick, which is why you see him constantly turn his camera so he can release the bind without the spell going off. In 10.1, all casters and healers will be able to use precog as an embellishment, which means landing interrupts and not getting juked is more crucial than ever. Is Peekaboo's kicking technique the solution? Probably not for everyone, but on paper it gives you slightly faster interrupts. Before we wrap things up, we want to tell you about an exciting new feature at SkillCap.com. For a limited time, SkillCap members can submit their gameplay to be reviewed by Rank 1 Gladiators, who will watch through arena footage and give personalized advice for how to improve. These reviews are added to our hundreds of arena commentaries and are quickly becoming one of the best resources for hitting your goals and getting the rating you've always wanted. We even have brand new micro commentaries where you can quickly learn key concepts for your class. In addition to hundreds of videos, you get to post questions anytime you want in our Ask a Pro Discord. Discord forum, where top players can give you personal tips and answer challenging PvP questions. Last season, we helped thousands of PvPers hit their rating goals from Challenger all the way up to Rank 1. We're the only place that guarantees you will gain at least 400 rating while actively using our website. And if you don't, then you shouldn't pay. We are able to make this promise because our service actually works. Visit the links below to learn more. As always though, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.